We are going to talk about hybrid orbitals. Oh boy. Uh, doesn't sound as bad as it is. If you're to the point where you want to understand hybrid orbitals, then it's presumed that you know a little bit uh, about uh, 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 electron configurations and, and what electrons are, are doing and where they are in certain configurations for atoms. And um, if the hybrid orbital concept is confusing to you or you've never seen it before or you want to learn about it, this is really the, the, the perfect way to transition from uh, what electrons are doing in simplified fashion to what they're actually doing when they form these hybrid orbitals and uh, form bonds with, with other atoms. All right? I'm going to start out with carbon because that would be the, um, uh, actually the, the most flexible uh, uh, element uh, that we can do the most with, with this particular topic. And when you're first learning chemistry, you learn a whole bunch of things uh, uh, about these elements on the periodic table. Uh, carbon is uh, uh, in group four. Its uh, uh, atomic number is six, and its atomic uh, mass is 12.01, uh, uh, or atomic weight uh, is 12.01. And uh, having a grand total of six protons and six electrons for presumably a neutral atom of carbon, but being in group four, uh, is because uh, at some point we learn that carbon has a grand total of six electrons, but there's two electrons in the first shell, and the remaining four are in the outermost shell for carbon, or what would be considered the valence shell, or shell number two for carbon, all right? So that's kind of like a, a simplified version where we say carbon quite simply has six electrons, and if we wanted further information about where those six electrons are, reside, or, or uh, uh, relatively speaking, where they are with respect to one another, two are in the first shell, and the four are in the outermost shell. And it's the four that you typically become concerned with because the amount of electrons in a, any atom's outermost shell will dictate a lot of behaviors uh, that it has, and especially uh, bonding uh, behaviors with uh, other atoms. So what we've got is uh, something like this that could be converted into a Lewis dot structure. And you probably have, if you're, again, if you're inquiring about hybrid orbitals, then you've probably already seen Lewis dot structures. And, then, and again, the dots are just shorthand for accounting for the proper number of electrons in the valence shell only. So we could be talking about an element that has a whole bunch of electrons in total, but if it just has four electrons uh, in its uh, outermost shell, then those would be the dots that we would characterize on the board here or on paper, uh, and those would be the ones that we would, we would be concerned about. Uh, typically following the octet rule, although if you get into more um, advanced uh, concepts and, and exceeding the octet, you may have cases where you have more than eight electrons, but uh, for the most part, we'll, we'll stick to uh, the octet rule. So in this particular case, we have eight slots available, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but carbon only having four electrons in that outermost shell takes up four of those uh, possible uh, eight spaces. When you do dot structures, there's also things that you can do in terms of uh, forming bonds. And when you use dot structures to solve uh, what a, um, uh, say for example, like a CH4 structure would be, um, we know that when all is said and done and we convert that to a line structure, our CH4 will look like this. And, but if we were accounting for the electrons individually, we would spec out carbon's four dots uh, just like that. Right Now, at some point, you also learn uh, a little bit more complex version of where these electrons reside, and that would be the uh, orbital theory. Not hybrid, we're not there yet, but just the uh, uh, atomic orbital theory. And what you learn is, say for example, in the first shell, the first shell has an s orbital, which can hold up to two electrons. So that's shell number one, and this second shell, shell number two, also has an S orbital. But it also has three P orbitals. 
and that's much closer to the, the reality of, of how the, how the uh, uh, electrons energetically reside in a carbon atom. So it's not just quite simply uh, that you've got two in the first shell and four in the second shell. We can kind of get into uh, subcategories of that to get more uh, descriptive in terms of what, what, where the electrons are, what they're doing, and, and the shape that those electrons take up while they're residing in those atoms. In this particular case, we would have the two electrons in shell number one, and we can show those here. And then these four electrons, if you were to do a what's called a ground state configuration of carbon, which you, you would also presumably have done if you're uh, to this point, that if you were to do a ground state configuration, the proper way of doing a ground state configuration would be to take the total electrons, fill the S first, and then go ahead and fill the P, which has uh, uh, multiple orbitals of that same energy level. We can actually say that this is the Px, this is the Py, and this is the Pz. But we have two electrons accounted for in shell number two. Uh, again, one, two, three, four, five, six electrons total, six. And we've got two in the first shell and two so far in the second shell, so all we need is just two more that will account for all six, and then also show how they distribute in the valence shell number two, which holds four out of those six. But the rules are that you will put them in unpaired like that. And if we had an excess, you say for example, if we were dealing with something like fluorine, fluorine would have uh, several more electrons, so that at some point we would have to pair some of them up in the p orbital because there would be no place to, uh, else to put them. But in this case, uh, carbon has a grand total of four in the shell number two here, and those four are put in this way. Two in the s, and then two in the p unpaired. So if you've gotten all of this and you're just getting into the concept of hybrid orbitals, it probably should have occurred to you at some point that we have a problem. And that problem is this. When you're doing four valence electrons all bonding with something uh, uh, from carbon, and in this case they would each be bonding to four hydrogens, you'll notice that these four dots are all going in four different directions as with this real molecule of CH4. Now this is drawn flat on the page, but in reality it's a three-dimensional tetrahedral structure. But uh, all four hydrogens are all jettisoning three-dimensionally in uh, uh, directions that are, are far apart from one another as possible. But how can that be when over here our four electrons are distributed this way? If we've got two electrons in the same orbital here and two unpaired here, it doesn't quite gel with this CH4 uh, structure that we've got here. And in order to properly explain that, I'm going to uh, maybe tell you a, a paint story. Let's say I go to the paint store with the hope of buying four cans of paint that are all the same color because I want to paint a room in my home that has four walls and that room in my home that has four walls um, I almost don't care what color uh, right but I get to the paint store and they've got only just one or two cans of every color and it's a nightmare because if I leave that paint store with a bunch of different colored cans, I, I don't achieve my objective. I'm going to paint one wall yellow, the other one red, the other one blue, the other one green, whatever. Uh, the closest that the paint store can come on this given day is they've got three cans of blue, and that's the most they have of any one color. So what I do is I buy my three cans of blue and I buy some other color, in this case I, I buy red, and I bring them home and I've got a decision to make because I really wanted the four walls all one color, right? So I could paint three of the four walls blue and one of the walls red. I could do that. Or I could take all four cans, mix them in a giant tub, and they wouldn't be blue when I'm done and they wouldn't be red, they'd be somewhere in between. Uh, they'd be some color purple, so maybe purple isn't my favorite color or what I uh, originally set out for these walls to be, 
but I'll take it because at least all, all four will be the same color, which was my, my primary objective. So let's say that in this scenario, for whatever reason, uh, we're on a planet that is, everything is exactly the same as the planet that we're on now, except for some bizarre reason they haven't invented the word purple. And so in this particular case, when, when you have a, some mixture of blue and red, you could have varying shades of purple, but we, we're not gonna call it purple. So in, on this planet, how they measure uh, the varying shades of purple is how many parts red to, to how many parts blue that you've got. All right. So in this particular case, we got three parts blue and one part red. And if I were to go to the paint store and want to paint my room purple intentionally, they could have cans of purple paint, but again, in varying shades of purple. But I can't go up to the desk and say, hey, can you give me something that's light purple or deep purple or, or whatever? Because they're not going to know what I'm talking about. Because on that planet, uh, the word purple hasn't been invented yet. So their simple uh, bookkeeping of, of trying to uh, decide which shade of purple I'm looking for, I just go up to the desk and I say, hey, do you have any RB3? And they say, yes, we do, right? Well, on this particular day, I wound up buying the three cans of blue and the one can of red myself and, and decided later that my ultimate decision was to mix them all together in a pot. So ultimately, after I mixed them all together in a giant tub, I wound up getting the equivalent of RB3 because I got a shade of purple that's more like the deeper blue, darker end of purple. I could, I could do other variations, which we'll see later, but in this particular case, I've got a shade of purple that's way more on the blue end than on the red end, and I'm characterizing that by the uh, symbol RB3, all right? The reason why that's significant in chemistry is that's kind of what's happening here with, with uh, carbon forming four bonds going in four definitive directions. It's been determined that all four of these bonds going in four different directions, in this case bonding to four hydrogens, uh, are really all equal in size and shape and energy level. So there isn't anything unique about this that's terribly different than the other three. But remember, the, the electrons really don't reside on little straight line tracks. That's why we learn this whole uh, atomic orbital concept because that's the more accurate picture of what these electrons are doing. So, you know, on the one hand, chemists are saying, well, the electrons really reside in these orbitals. And again, to review, the S would be a spherical shape orbital, or a smiley face, and the P type orbitals are kind of these dumbbell shaped orbitals. So we could have PX, P, PX, PY, and PZ would actually be the third possible direction, which would be that it would be actually coming straight out of the board at you. So these, these orbitals come in threes with the, with the PX, the PY, and the PZ. Uh, and in that particular case, we've got one, two, three, four orbitals, but it doesn't really jive with what we see here with these four going in four distinct directions and also having uh, the same uh, size, shape, and energy level for the electrons in them. So we've got a problem because the P orbitals are higher in energy than the S. They're also a different shape blah, blah, blah. Well, what they found is in order for this actually, uh, the, the best way to describe in reality what's happening with these electrons is these orbitals become hybridized. And when the orbitals become hybridized, you literally take your S orbital, mix it up with the three available P orbitals, and the four orbitals that come out the other end are all equal to one another. And those orbitals are S, P, 3. So they're neither S or P. They are a mixed up combination of the two incoming quantities. And when we're done, we have four equal orbitals uh, in size, shape, and energy level that are all a hybrid because they're not quite S anymore. They're not quite P. There's something in between. Uh, and character-wise, they're, they're more like P than they are S. And so that's why uh, when chemists didn't come up with a clever word for this brand new orbital that was created, just like on this other planet, somebody couldn't come up with the word purple, they said, well, we're just going to describe it by its, its components. 
So in this particular case, we have RB3. In this particular case, we have new orbitals that are created that are called sp3, but at least they're all equal to one another. So what, what is presumed to happen, which, which does, is one of the electrons comes out of one of the electrons, or one of the orbitals where they were paired up to begin with, and it comes over to this empty one. So that that way, each electron can reside in its own separate orbital. But again, as this is happening, the S's and the P's are mixing together so that they all wind up being uh, completely equal in every way. And that's what you got. So this completely solves the inconsistency between what we see over here and what we had originally seen over here. Again, it's something that they will teach you in first semester chemistry that uh, you, know, you, you, you learn how many valence electrons you've got, you learn how to do a dot structure, and then later learn how to actually make a, uh, a, a molecular structure uh, with dots or lines where now you're combining atoms of the same type or atoms of different types, but it never really completely gelled with the uh, ground state configuration uh, that you're doing when you're first learning how to do electron orbital configurations. So the whole hybrid concept basically is no different than combining paint when it comes down to it. That when we're combining uh, electrons uh, of atoms to form bonds, in many cases uh, hybrids or mix-ups are formed, mash-ups I suppose, uh, are formed so that in order for this, uh, uh, in order for us to come up with a, a mathematical explanation that, that's consistent at, with reality, uh, because this is what we see in reality, this is what's happening. So we have sp3 just like we have purple, which is rb3. All right. So again, this, this isn't the only situation that carbon could be in, right? Carbon could be in a completely different situation. Let's say that, uh, Let's say we've got a case where carbon is the center atom of this molecule, but instead of having four single bonds all the way around, it has two singles and one double. So now the question is, is well, how do we account for the fact that carbon is double bonded to this oxygen? Because if we go back and see what these lines are born out of, then we will recall that for every line that represents a pair of electrons. So really, out of carbon's four available electrons, it's pointing two in that same direction. And hydrogen is here, and I'll just make the oxygen dex, I guess, according to the periodic table and the group that oxygen is in. Oxygen is in group six, so even though it has a grand total of eight electrons, six of those eight would be uh, its valence electrons. So, so if we were going to do a dot configuration involving oxygen, assuming that we're, we've got a neutral oxygen and it's not in a, uh, an, a bizarre situation, then we're gonna use six dots, uh, or X's in this case, to represent oxygen. So this accounts for everybody's electrons. We have a hydrogen X and a carbon dot to form one bond line. We have a carbon dot and a hydrogen X. And in this case, we have a double bond because carbon is providing two electrons for that same bonding area, and oxygen is providing two electrons for that same bonding area. But it raises a question because, uh, you know, compared to our CH4 example, we no longer have, uh, you know, four uh, electrons going in four very different uh, directions. How do we achieve? with the uh, orbital hybrid orbital explanation, how do we achieve a double bond? How do we explain what all four of these electrons are doing? Well, it turns out that with uh, carbon and, for example, uh, other things too, oxygen and nitrogen, w when you have an uh, atom that's involved in a double bond, in order to achieve that double bond, you're sending two electrons really uh, in the same direction. Now that, now that those two electrons um, one from carbon, one from oxygen, cannot occupy the same orbital as uh, these two here. They need their own orbital uh, because there's a, a max of two electrons in any given orbital, regardless of size, shape, energy level, whether it's a hybrid, whether it's not a hybrid. So you can either have zero, one, or two uh, electrons in an orbital. So how, do we, how does carbon achieve this? How does carbon send a grand total of 
two electrons in two separate orbitals connecting to the same thing. Um, and how it does it is it actually uses a pure p orbital in order to accomplish this. So one of these orbitals is going to be a hybrid, just like these other two are, uh, much like what we saw with the CH4, where they were hybrid all the way around. But the other orbital to achieve this will actually be accomplished with a pure p orbital. So carbon is actually saving out a pure p in order to accomplish this double bond with oxygen. That's how it does it orbital-wise. What that means is the remaining three orbitals are hybrid. Is this confusing? Not really. Not if you look at it in terms of the paint scenario. Uh, I bring my paints home and I may change my mind. I say, I've got three blues and one red. And I say, you know what? I think I'm going to get a little funky here. I think maybe I am going to paint one wall different than the others. But I don't want that standalone color to be red. It'd be easy because then I could just paint one red and the rest of the three blue mission accomplished. But I've got to make things difficult for myself, which I often do. I say, you know what? I want one of the walls to be pure blue. And then I'll mix the remaining uh, cans together so that the other three walls will be exactly the same color. And when I do that, I have a distribution of blue on one wall. So I'll save this guy out. And then I mix just these other three cans. So my shade of purple this time that survives the cut is made from one can of red and two cans of blue. So it's a different shade of purple than I had one time. And again, I could, the guys at the paint store will know exactly what I'm talking about. And I could say, you know what? I painted my last room RB3, but I think I'm going to go with a different shade. I think I'll go with RB2 this time. And they'll know that it's not quite as deep blue and it's a little closer to the red end of purple in our varying spectrum shades of purple. So in this particular case, one of my walls is pure blue, and the remaining three walls are a different shade of purple, uh, which is made up of one can of red, one part red and two parts blue, essentially. Carbon does the same thing when it's forming a double bond. Carbon says, well, I'm going to have to save out a pure P in order to accomplish this double bond. And, uh, you know, again, pictorially, you know, maybe I'll get back to the picture of the CH4. Pictorially, I could say, well, I've got these bubbly type of bonds. And we've got the other ends here for each one, but I'm not going to worry about that. And then what does hydrogen contribute? Hydrogen con contributes a pure S. So we've got kind of a mess. Uh, but with the hope of producing something that's a little more accurate, because we know electrons uh, aren't little dots that literally shuttle back and forth between atoms uh, on a straight line on a train track. It's not what's happening at all. They're taking up three-dimensional space, and the three-dimensional space that they're taking up uh, are, are bubbles of some sort, either spherical bubbles or uh, dumbbell-shaped bubbles, or as we can see with hybrid, something in between. So uh, this is a, sad as it is, something a little bit more... Uh, 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 accurate compared to just a CH4 with four lines going in each direction because we know the electrons are, are not traveling linear back and forth to, to solidify that bond, right? So if we were to, to uh, attempt a three-dimensional structure for something like this, then what we could do is we could replace these dots and X's traveling back and forth on straight lines with something a little bit more accurate, but thanks to my lack of artwork here, not much more accurate. And that would look something like this. I'm going to have hybrid orbitals here. I'll finish my H in red there if you don't mind. And then oxygen will also use hybrid orbitals. The hydrogen will use S orbitals to connect with whatever carbon's hydrogen, hybrid orbitals are. But we said that carbon forms a double bond with oxygen. So anybody involved in the double bond, whether it's carbon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, I'm sorry, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen can't form a double bond. So to accomplish this double bond, instead of, you know, because we had just two double bond lines, a C double bond of two and O, boy, it's, boy is that simple. But in reality, it's a little bit more complex than that. The first of these double bond lines is actually uh, more accurate, accurately present, uh, uh, represented with these orbital bubbles that have 
those electrons just kind of bouncing all over the place, being two of them, one from carbon, one from oxygen. The p orbitals are kind of again they're 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 dumbbell shaped, so they're 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 two lobes, so they're actually above and below where the uh, the original first bond would be. So the communication of a pair of electrons both above and below this uh, original orbital here actually accounts for both lines in this double bond. So that one, say, being this one, and the above and the below being this one, and the two of these together, as uh, grotesque as that looks, is actually a more accurate representation of what the electrons are doing, how they're shuttling back and forth and communicating and solidifying that bond between the C and the O. And uh, carbon achieves that double bond by using a pure p orbital to make that connection with oxygen's pure p orbital. But in order to do that, it takes out a pure p. And when carbon takes out a pure p, what it's got left from the remaining hybrid mixture, the remaining three hybrid orbitals, or in my paint case, my remaining three walls, would just be one part s and two parts p. So in that particular case, we're going to have a sp2 hybrid three times, one, two, three, and then saving out a pure p. So what you'll notice is, is if carbon's ground state, way back when we did the ground state, one s and three p's, carbon's ground state for its, um, for its valence shell had four orbitals, one s, three p's, so four orbitals mathematically. Four orbitals in, four orbitals out. So the first example with our methane, with our CH4, we had three, uh, we, excuse me, we had sp3, but we had four of them all on the same equal uh, energy. But it still added up to four. In this particular case, this is just a, another variety of orbitals that add up to four. Just like my room always has four walls, so when I come home with four cans of paint, I could come with a, home with a variety of combinations of colors, uh, you know, um, a, a, as we can see. Or, or mix them up in a variety of combinations. But I'm still talking about four cans of paint in, four cans of paint on the wall when I'm done. So mathematically, it all adds up. So in this particular case, we're saving out a pure P, maybe the PZ orbital. And one of Cartman's electrons is, is helping accomplish bond number two in this double bond. And the other three remaining electrons of carbon are one each in the hybrids, which again, aren't the same hybrid as this sp3 all the way around because in this case we've pulled a pure p out and that instead leaves us with sp2 all the way around all right uh, in this particular case we've got direct overlaps which will be uh, sigma bonds that's the best sigma i could do and these p over overlaps the way that they overlap the way that they connect this way would be uh, pi bonds. So terminology-wise, when you start seeing uh, three-dimensional drawings and, and uh, uh, different categorizations of, of three-dimensional hybrid bonds, then that's, that's what we've got. Now, uh, does it get more complicated? A little bit. Because we can have carbon in a triple bond situation. Uh, typically, if we're, again, unless we're talking about something bizarre like uh, you know, a radical situation or a, 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 a charged situation or whatever, a, a neutral carbon will typically be comfortable forming four bonds, but we have a number of different combinations in which that can happen, right? We can have carbon in four singles, we can have carbon in a double and two singles, which is what we just saw, we can have carbon in a triple and a single, and we can even have carbon in two doubles. In each case, all of these add up to four, so it's just a matter of how they distribute and what orbitals we're using to accomplish that. In this case, we have an interesting situation because carbon is in a triple bond. Well, in order for carbon to accomplish that triple bond, what it actually does is now it actually utilizes two separate p orbitals. So the connection between itself and nitrogen <coughs> is uh, triple bonded because it'll use pure p orbital for connection number one, pure p orbital for connection number two, and the remaining hybrid mixture for uh, connection number three. Uh, and so since we're using two P's and sparing them from the, the mix in the tub, uh, then our remaining hybrid would just be one part S and one part P. So that's SP1, or a lot of times they just call it SP. So for this situation, carbon in a triple bond, it's just SP, 
but one of those is a hybrid, and we also have uh, a hybrid going in the direction of connect with hydrogen. So there's two there, and then a pure PZ and maybe a pure P1. And again, we have electrons there. So we account for all four of carbon's electrons in a triple bond, because in order to achieve that triple bond, we actually have three sets of electrons going in the same direction. And the only way we can achieve that is utilizing two p orbitals, one p orbital going this way, the other p orbital going that way, and then the uh, hybrid sigma going right down the middle accomplishes its goal because carbon can form three uh, connections with nitrogen. Nitrogen does the same thing, by the way. It uses two pure p orbitals and then a, uh, a sigma hybrid going right down the middle so that it can actually, uh, you can shuttle three pairs of electrons in the same linear direction without getting in each other's way or, or attempting to take up uh, uh, each other's orbitals. They're all in separate orbitals, and the way to do that is with uh, the use of pure p orbitals. So uh, in that case, we have a variety of situations. This is the start, um, and that's why carbon is a good one to look at, but then you can look at hybridizations with uh, nitrogen, like I had mentioned, uh, oxygen, and then you can even get into more uh, complex hybridizations with, say, resonance uh, structures. But it all starts with this. So if you have a, a real understanding of, of what this uh, crazy terminology is with the SP2s and the SP3s uh, and, and start out using carbon as an example, it will really help uh, uh, you know, understand the more complex examples as you go on. So hope that helped.